Well, <clears throat> good morning everybody and welcome to St Mary's Vicarage on this Saturday, the 3rd of April, Easter Saturday. And um, it's uh, good to be with you this morning, uh, a lot colder than it was uh, yesterday for Good Friday. Um, but it was good yesterday to uh, be able to do the um, uh, our walk of the cross and um, uh, a handful of people turned up for that and we were able to sort of walk out into the uh, fields behind the church and follow the 14 stations of, of the cross and sing some hymns, though we all admitted that uh, uh, we're a bit out of practice for sing <coughs> hymn singing. Um, I felt quite dizzy at one point, <laughs> um, having not sung hymns for, for such a long time. Uh, but it was good to be able to do that and mark um, Good Friday. And also thank you to those who have been producing Easter eggs and um, pop them on the, the cherry tree. Please carry on doing that over the Easter holidays and break if you want to make um, uh, youngsters as well. If you want to make uh, Easter eggs and place them on the... Uh, the cherry tree outside the church please do that and i also see an easter garden appeared uh, there might be a few other there this morning when i go and have a look uh, thank you for for those <clears throat> so today on easter saturday uh this evening at 8 p.m i do apologize that i there was a typo it was my mistake in the downsman so if you receive the downsman i put the services light would be at 7 p.m but unfortunately it doesn't start to get dark until 7 45 today so um, the service of light is at 8 p.m. It's at 8 p.m. So if you do see others, please um, uh, let them know about that. <clears throat> and there's two opportunities. You can either do the service at light of light at home with your uh, with your family, following the the little service that is printed in the Downsman. Um, there's also some instructions there about how to make a Paschal candle, an Easter candle, if you wish. Uh, if not, the idea is simply to have a light. It could be a candle or an electric light that we light as part of that ceremony to, in a sense, mark the beginning of um, Easter, the resurrection. Um, often these services, traditionally, the services of light, uh, a little bit like midnight mass on Christmas Eve, were done um, round about 11 o'clock um, or so on Easter Eve. And if you do the full liturgy, what they sometimes call the Easter liturgy, uh, which I have done in the past, <coughs> um, it lasts about three hours or so. You you start with what's called the Easter Vigil, um, which is normally about an hour's worth of, of Bible readings and meditation, which takes you right from Genesis, uh, the call of Abraham to um, uh, um, Jacob, and then on to Moses, and then the prophets, etc., and then through to Jesus. Um, so you have a whole series of readings and, and, and prayers in church. Um, and then this is followed by... Um, the service of light, which is lighting the Easter bonfire outside, symbolising the light coming back into the world. It's a very powerful and beautiful liturgy, though it's hard for small rural churches to do this properly because it often involves a, a large number of people to do it properly. Um, some cathedrals um, do this. Um, uh, when I was in Oxford Diocese, Oxford Cathedral did that, and we would often um, travel into Oxford. It was... <coughs> um, with the rural churches I belong to, to take part in their service of light, because then you would get the full sort of spectacular feeling, which was, you know, the cathedral choir and uh, all of the things. And of course, as I was a canon there, I was able to, to take part in the liturgy. Um, rural churches, because <laughs> it tends to be a cast of thousands with these sort of things, we struggle a bit, but we we, we do things. So you have the service of light, the Easter bonfire is, is lit. And then from that, the large candle that's normally by the font, which we light for christenings, which is known as a Paschal candle, um, that is uh, blessed. <clears throat> and um, it's blessed in a very particular way. There's normally a cross on the candle that has the date and it'll have uh, the Greek letters Alpha and Omega, which are the sort of A to Z of the Greek alphabet, symbolising that Jesus is the beginning and the end. And then the cross is blessed by putting five nails in the cross, um, five grains of incense, basically, um, to mark the five wounds of Christ. And then you light the candle and the congregation then moves into church uh, with their own candles. And as you stand at the door of the church, the church should be completely dark. Every light should be out. No candles lit. It should be completely dark. 
And as you walk into the door of the church, which in a, in a sense, the idea is the door symbolizes the, the tomb in a sense, uh, and the world <clears throat> and you walk in and then you the paschal candle is held up and either the priest or a curate or a deacon or something will sing the light of christ and then the whole congregation respond thanks be to god and then from the paschal candle the congregation then light all of their tapers and uh, there's a little bit of that tonight and then you go into the church and you process around the church singing this song and then uh, all of the candles uh, are lit in church. So you have this beautiful vision and you can imagine what it's like in a cathedral as well, that slowly light grows and grows and grows and grows and grows as, um, as all the candles are lit. And then you end up at the font <coughs> and uh, the, the paschal candle is traditionally then plunged into the font three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to mark the symbolism between, in a sense, the Holy Spirit come, that coming down at Jesus's um, baptism and then through the death <clears throat> and resurrection of Christ, we have the promise of eternal life, which we gain through baptism. Um, and at that point, uh, sometimes in the service, there would be a baptism. You would baptise people at that point or you sprinkle the congregation with um water you have a beautiful song called the exaltat which has a lovely word in it um it gives praise be to mother bee um who makes the the candle wax the bees wax you see um and then that sort of goes on and then you would have your eucharist holy communion uh first holy communion of easter so if you do the full thing it's about sort of three hours or so and then the communion you end up with the communion sort of after midnight so the first communion of uh, of easter Anyhow, we're going to have a little taste of that this evening. You can either do this at home or join us up outside the church this, for this service of light. It's not going to take three hours. Um, I think it'll probably be about 20 minutes, half an hour, what we're going to do outside the church. I've just taken the service of light from the whole Easter liturgy. But we'll meet outside the church and uh, we'll have my big brazier there, fire pit, and we'll light the fire. We'll bless the Easter candle and then we'll light that. And then if people have brought their own candles and such like, though I will have others that can be given out, we'll light those candles and we'll take the, <coughs> we'll take the Easter candle into the church and it'll be placed by the, by the font. Um, and um, we'll do the bit of the exaltat. We are gonna be able to sing some hymns tonight. So we're gonna sing a hymn at the beginning and then we'll also sing a hymn at the end, but we'll have to come outside the church um, for that. So that's this evening, the service of light this evening. And then tomorrow morning, there's two Holy Communion services, one down, one here at Handley at 10 o'clock, which will be broadcast online, and uh, another one at 11.15 um, um, down at uh, Pentridge. Now, the service of light, providing the tech works and everything like that, um, we will try and broadcast that live um this evening so uh do um uh, do join us for that either physically or do the little service at home on your own or watch us on um, facebook now i don't have a bible reading for you this morning believe it or not because there, there is no liturgy for today because the tradition is that after good friday has happened um you don't have a com communion or a service until you get to Easter Eve or Easter Day and Easter Saturday is has always has always been an interesting thing to reflect on I mean for many of us it's a day of busyness um, uh, because we may be busy getting ready for relatives or friends coming to join us or they may have joined us normally at the weekend we might be getting ready for our Easter Sunday <coughs> lunch or to travel to see relatives in normal times um, it's busy, you know, you may have forgotten to buy your Easter eggs and that sort of thing. So there's all that sort of preparation going on for us in that sense. And it's also normally a busy time in our churches. The flower teams will be in the churches getting the flowers ready for Easter and uh, church wardens and other people will be dealing with getting things, uh, making sure the church is ready with the vicar. I'll be over there going over shortly just to make sure the altar cloths and things 
we've sort of got all that sorted out. So it's often a day of busyness in that sense, but it's it's a day of busyness because in a sense, we know what's happening the next day, which is Easter Sunday. So we're getting ready for it. But in a sense, the whole point of Easter Saturday, this sort of, um, you know, Jesus spends three days in the <clears throat> in the tomb. And there's a lot of theology behind that, which I won't go into this morning. But in a sense, um, <clears throat> it's worth us reflecting and taking ourselves back to that very first Easter. Because, of course, the <clears throat> the disciples and Jesus's followers didn't know what was going to happen on Easter Sunday, even though Jesus had told them time and time again about the prophecies. And he told them, you know, in three days, build this temple, all of those sorts of hints. The disciples really hadn't picked this up. And in the cross on Good Friday, what the disciples saw and experienced was absolute failure, was that everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. <laughs> All of the hopes and dreams that they had had about establishing a new Jerusalem, a new kingdom. And remember that they were still tending to think very much in earthly terms, not in spiritual and divine terms, had gone wrong. A few days before, it had seemed to be all going right as they entered Jerusalem triumphantly on what we call Palm Sunday. Um, the real hope then was I think probably the disciples were thinking that the people would rise up, <coughs> deal with the Romans, uh, deal with the puppet king and <coughs> establish a, a new dynasty in Jerusalem with Jesus at the head and the disciples by his side. Of course, it all started to go wrong very, very quickly. And within a few days, um, Jesus was uh, arrested and taken away and tried and then executed and crucified. So for the disciples on that first Easter Saturday, um, it's worth us reflecting today what they must have felt like. First of all, the grief that was in their hearts, their Lord and Master and friend that they had spent three years with living very closely, travelling from town to town, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom was now lying in a stone cold tomb. So their grief must have been completely overwhelming for them. Alongside this grief, of course, was immense fear because they had seen what had happened to Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, they were probably and were hugely fearful that what of what would happen to them, that they, in a sense, would be next. And we see this fear highlighted um, on Good Friday when Peter betrays Jesus three times, denies any knowledge of him for fear of what may happen to him. And we also hear that, in a sense, that the disciples, you know, at the arrest in the garden, they ran away. And, you know, we find that they're they're dispersed. So this immense grief that they're suffering, this immense fear, and then finally, in a sense, this maybe utter sense of failure, that utter sense of failure. And for many people in the world, that can be or is the human condition, which is why the passion is so important, because it's God entering into and through Jesus, our whole human condition. Many of us in our own lives would have felt the huge weight of grief and the pain uh, that that brings, the desolation, the, the feeling of complete ending, in a sense, when we lose somebody dear to us or we love, that sense of grief. Some of us in our lives may have felt that complete sense of failure. You know, it may be in a sense through a, a, a job we were doing, our work, or it might be failure in a relationship or failure in all sorts of ways that we have to deal with as human beings, that utter sense of failure. And many of us would have felt fear in our lives, fearful of what was going to happen next, what is going to happen next for all sorts of reasons. These are the three prime things that are here with us on Easter Saturday. 
Now, of course, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know what's coming next. The disciples didn't. But why I think Easter Saturday is important is because <clears throat> it teaches us that despite things feeling completely lost, despite being completely overwhelmed with grief, despite feeling a complete failure, and despite feeling that God has abandoned us, remember Jesus on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Feeling that God has abandoned us and is distant and that we are in a hopeless situation. Easter Saturday reminds us that even though we may feel like that at times, that the darkness has completely overwhelmed us in the same way that maybe if we're in the sea and one of those huge waves engulfs us and we fear that we're never going to come up for breath again. What happens is that God is at work constantly. God's power of redemption, God's mercy, God's light is at work. And even though we might not feel it or be able to see it or experience it, the power of God is there. And that's what we celebrate this evening in our little service of light and tomorrow in our Easter services. That despite that huge feeling of despondency, that feeling that God has maybe abandoned us, that actually the power of God is there. And as sure as the sunrise in the morning, God's power and light will break through, will rescue us, and will call us forward. And that really is the message of Easter Saturday, the thing that we need to reflect on. The helplessness we may feel in our lives, particularly as a result of this pandemic that we are going through, but also knowing and trusting in the hope that God is at work and that his power and love and light will break through. So I hope you'll be able to join me uh, either physically up at the church this evening at 8 p.m. or online or you're doing a little service um, at home. Uh, and if not, maybe uh, see you tomorrow either online or um, uh, actually physically for one of our church services. Anyway, have a good Easter Saturday. But in your busyness today, preparing for whatever you're preparing to do tomorrow, just reflect on on that that sense of hopelessness, but the sense of hope that God is indeed coming as our rescuer. Amen. Take care, folks. Have a good day and uh, look forward to maybe seeing some of you this evening.